Genesis. Uh, we're just sitting here chilling with Pastor Steve and Miss Pat. Um, going to do something a little different. I was kind of jealous last week. Pastor Steve got to preach over here, so I was like, you know what? Let's all get over here together and just kind of have an intimate acoustic set. Uh, so, Pastor Steve and Miss Pat, thank you for opening your house and allowing us to be over here and worship together. So, we hope that you enjoy it. Today will be a little bit different, uh, but it's all about praising the Lord. Uh, Scripture says where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is also. And we know that if you're a born-again believer, the Spirit dwells within us as well. But here we are today. This is the church right now. And we miss you very much. We're looking forward to worshiping with you again. So uh, let's go into a time of worship. Then he rose.
Grace is God's unmerited favor for us, his crazy love. And the truth is, many times we struggle understanding it. If you find yourself struggling to understand God's grace, don't beat yourself up. Even the disciples struggled with understanding grace. Jesus, is that you? You're alive. I can't believe you're alive. Okay, I was in the boat and I wasn't catching any fish, okay? But I heard this voice and the voice said, cast your net to the other side. And so I'm thinking, I'm a fisherman. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not catching any fish, you know? And so I throw that net over there and then a gaggle of fish pop into that net and I'm going, this is a total miracle. Who could have done that? I need to know who told me to throw the net to the other side. And boom, I look up and I mean, there is you. You're looking at me on the seashore going, it is I, the Lord, and you're alive. I can't believe you're alive. <laughs> this is awesome. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on. Peter, yeah. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. I love you. You're alive. This is so great. Good. And, then feed my sheep. Andrew, get out of the boat. Come on, man. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? I love you. Yes. And I'm so sorry about that rooster cluck, and I had no idea what that meant, but I do not. I'm better for it. All right. Okay. Then feed my sheep. Andrew, I'm smiling, but I'm serious. Come on, get out of the boat. It's him. Peter. Yeah. Do you love me? Jesus, mere words cannot describe the passion that I have for you. I love you. You know everything. I love you. Good. Good. Then feed my sheep. I didn't even know you had livestock. That is so like you, though. There's something new about you all the time. That's what I love about you. Peter, yeah. do you remember uh, the morning the ladies went to the tomb? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're all in the upper room trying to figure out what to do next, you know, because we thought you were dead. You know, you were dead, you know, and we're trying to figure all that out, you know. And Mary comes running up, and Mary's like saying, beehive, beehive, beehive. And I'm thinking, I'm allergic to bees. Like, keep them out. You know what I'm saying? But as she kept getting closer, I heard her correctly. She was saying, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. And we're going, who's alive, who's alive? And she said, she was at the tomb, and the tomb was empty. And she said that the, there was an angel there. And the angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay, he is risen. And so me and John, we hightailed it down there. And if John says he beat me, he's totally lying, all right? I beat him, FYI, all right, you know? And we get down there and I'm looking in that tomb and it is, it is empty. There's nothing in there, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mean? And John is right there. John is so good with words. He should write a book. He is so good with words. And John said, don't you get it, Peter? This is everything Jesus said he was going to do, and you did it, and it's done. Let's go. This is so great. Wait, yeah. the angel said what? Uh, go tell the disciples and Peter that everything is okay. He is risen. You've risen. Let's go. This he is said okay. what? Go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. You said my name. Why did you say my name? Peter, that's grace. No, no, I don't, I don't deserve that because that night people kept coming up to me asking me if I belonged to you, if I was with you, and I kept denying you left and right, all right? No, no it'll take me my whole life to make up for what I did. It was unforgivable no, for what I did. No, What I did on the cross was meant to take what is unforgivable and make it forgivable. That's my grace. It's not about you. It's always about me. That's grace, Peter. Our scripture today is from the book of John, the 21st chapter, verses 15 through 25 from the New Living Translation. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dress yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. 
Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So the rumor spread among the community of believers that this disciple wouldn't die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This disciple is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. Jesus also did many other things. If they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank Pat for reading the scripture for us. And uh, today we're in our final part of the series. And then, and now we're going to look at the conversation after breakfast. Now, this scripture is, and Pat didn't even read the part about the actual breakfast, but Jesus walks up and the disciples are out fishing. You remember the story? They basically gave up uh, and said, well, we might as well go back and do what we're good at because we don't know what's going to happen now about Jesus after his crucifixion. And um, they're not sure what's going on. So they fall back on the old way. And uh, that was a, a sermon in itself last year. But the great part about this story is when you think about that breakfast, that Jesus cooked them breakfast. Now, I'm sure he didn't bring the ingredients to bake the bread, and I'm sure he didn't have to go fishing and bring the fish or stop at the deli on his way and pick up some, uh, you know, locks and bagels for them to have for, for breakfast. So just that miracle meal has always fascinated me. Uh, you know how I like to eat. So just imagining how good a meal could be that Jesus cooked. And so they have this great meal together. You know, Peter jumps out of the boat and he swims back to Jesus all excited. And, and it seems like a really great time. And all of a sudden it goes from this casual breakfast to a conversation after the breakfast. Jesus pulls Peter aside, and Peter and Jesus have this conversation. So the verses that P that Pat read for us tell us that story. This final scene in John's gospel concludes with that story of Peter and John by depicting what happens in their lives and how they go on to glorify Christ, how they live after this glorification of Jesus Christ and build the church. We stand, um, I'm sorry, they stand as two examples of Jesus' work in the community of faith. Jesus working to build each of us to be the people that he's called us to be. So then, after breakfast, and then, Peter and Jesus have this conversation. Now, last week we know when we talked about Thomas and Peter's, or Thomas and Jesus, sorry, conversation, we did a little background into who Thomas was. Now, as we said last week, there's not a lot known about Thomas, but there is a lot known about Peter. Peter had been a prominent figure since the beginning of the Gospels, since Jesus called him, and his brother James actually brings Simon, son of John, as he was referred to then, to Jesus, and Jesus calls him. Andrew says to him, we have found the Messiah. And Simon, the son of God, John, goes to meet Jesus. And Jesus calls him to be his disciple and to follow him. It's interesting, though, that very soon after that, we read in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus says this to Matthew in, or to Peter in Matthew 16, 18. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means the rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Here we see that Jesus gives Simon the son of John a new name and says that he is going to be Peter, 
the foundation of how where he's going to build and how he is going to build his church. Here's this man, Peter, called by Jesus, called to be one of the leaders of the church, the foundation of which the church is built, and he had this lovely disease that I refer to as foot-in-the-mouth disease. He had such a great ability of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, of interrupting when he, sh when he should have been quiet, and, and always questioning, always, you know, it's just amazing. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it seems to be something that I'm pretty good at and need to consider. And when we think about this, and you know, I'm, you know, I always talk too much. You know, I always, a lot of times, not always, thank God, but a lot of times speak before I think. Or as many of you like to say here, I have that New York attitude, and well, that's just the way it is. But see, when you stop and think, that Peter was this same guy. Now, think about this. One of the most meaningful portions of all of Scripture is in John, when John talks about the Last Supper. And John shares what goes on in that Last Supper. And here is this, so such a touching moment where Jesus, the rabbi, Jesus, the leader, Jesus, the Messiah, takes the time to show by washing the disciples' feet what it means to be a servant and what it means to serve others as God has called us to do. And sure enough, Peter has to speak up. Oh, no, 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 don't do this to me. You know, you, I'm not worthy. Don't do this. And, and Jesus says, you don't understand. I have to do this. And then Peter won't even accept that. He says, no, no, don't then wash all of me. And Jesus has to interrupt this meaningful moment to explain to Peter that all of this is not important. What's important is that he knows that he is being a servant. And you don't need to wash his whole body. He's just trying to make this point. It is reassuring again for me to know that this man who did this numerous times to Jesus is the one who Jesus says is the foundation of the church. It's great when you and I realize that Jesus chooses people like Peter or people like you and me to be a part of the family of God and be a part of the building of that family of God. So we move on from Peter to the focus on the conversation. The risen Lord speaks to Peter, calling him Simon, son of John. Remember, that was the name he called him when he, or he said to him when he first called him to be one of the disciples, when he called him to follow him. Jesus was basically, I think, giving Simon, son of John, or giving Peter a do-over. He was going back to his original name, what he knew him when they first met. Now, we talked last week about nicknames and about how Thomas was called the twin. And those names that people give us, like I said to you, I was sort of upset because the first few months I went there, I didn't have a nickname. I wasn't like everybody else. I wasn't given that special name. And, and Jesus, as we read in Matthew, calls and changes Peter's name. He calls him Peter and says he's going to be the rock. But now, all of a sudden, as this conversation starts, we see that Jesus is going right back to the beginning. Jesus is saying to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, he reminds him through these names. He reminds Peter that Jesus is the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, and that he calls us by name. And we know his name. We know his voice, and we follow him because we hear him calling us by name. The threefold pattern of the conversation with Peter seems to be intended to counterbalance Peter's earlier three denials of knowing Jesus, which Jesus had predicted. 
In their conversation, Jesus enables Peter to move beyond their previous relationship, his previous relationship to Peter. So Peter can claim what Jesus said through, what God said through Jesus in that final discourse, that we could have unity, intimacy, and mutuality with God and with Jesus Christ. That unity, we are one in Christ. We are one body of Christ. We are brothers and sisters with Jesus Christ and called by God as part of God's family. So we have this unity. There's this intimacy that we have in our relationship with God, that everything is about love. This is all based on God's love for us and our love for him. We're gonna talk about that more as we look at this, continue to look at this conversation. We have this mutuality. We're all in this together. We all have a job to do. There's, there's people aren't different. The one person's not better than the next. One person's not important, more important than the next. We're all in this together. We all have a call. We all have to do what God has called us to do for his church to grow. Jesus' initial question contains the comparison with the other disciples to Peter. He says to Peter, do you love me more than these? Now remember, previously in the gospel, we read about Peter saying to Jesus, I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to do everything it takes more than the rest of these, more than the other disciples. He boasted about he, how he would be the one that would lay down his life for Jesus. Peter had earlier said that, and now he ignores that whole comparison in his response. Jesus' charge to Peter was regularly interpreted as Peter's pastoral call. Peter's call to be the leader of the church, to step out and to be that pastor and be the leader for the church. We read earlier in Mark that, or Matthew, that Jesus said he would be the foundation of the church. And, and we see now that Peter is reminded as Jesus calls him and says to him, Peter, feed my sheep. These verses position Peter as the model of what it means to live out our love for Christ. In the heart of these verses, verses 15 through 17, lies the relationship between Peter and Jesus and the love that Peter has for Jesus and how he is charged to show that love by feeding his sheep. Jesus is reminding Peter of the words found in the Gospel of John. In the 13th chapter, verses 34 and 35, says this, Now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love one another. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. We see here Jesus telling people to put his love for Jesus into practice by feeding and tending his sheep. These words called Peter to nurture and protect God's flock. Jesus, as I said earlier, is the good shepherd, but he's also the chief shepherd, and pastors are under shepherds. Now, I put this in here because when I preach to you, when I share with you, um, Jesus is saying usually more to me than to you. And in the study that I did for this, many of the commentaries talk about how important this is for pastors to understand. This is the most important thing a pastor can do to show his love for Jesus Christ. The most important thing I can do to show my love for Jesus Christ is to truly love the people that Jesus has given to me to serve. If I am to truly love Jesus, I need to pastor with the kind of love that he does when I pastor the sheep and, and care for all of us tenderly together. So my prayer is that you pray for me, that I show my love for Jesus 
by loving and caring for the flock that I've been called to serve. And then Jesus predicts how Peter will serve him. Peter will give his life for Christ. Peter will be a martyr. The expression we find in that 18th verse, stretch out your arms, is a specific reference to Peter's death by crucifixion. When Christ first called Peter, Christ asked Peter to follow him, and Peter seems to be willing to follow him all the way. And now we see in this progression as Peter grows closer to Christ and shows that love for Christ, he backs up what he believed way back in the beginning. He backs up what he said that he would be willing to follow Jesus and die for him. Because we see in this that Jesus was crucified for Christ. And then we see the last part of this conversation. Here's Peter being Peter again. Jesus is having the conversation telling him how he is going to do so much and he's going to die for Jesus. And then Peter looks around and sees John over there and turns to Jesus and says, what about him? Wondering if John, John would experience the same thing and would experience being crucified for Christ. Peter begins to compare himself with John again. Will John glorify by God through being martyred? It seems that the disciples love to compare themselves with each other. Uh, they seem to be extremely competitive. And Peter wants to know where he compares with John. He wants to rank himself with John. Jesus doesn't seem to be too pleased with this question from Peter. And he abruptly, he abruptly answers Peter to basically say to Peter, Peter, this is none of your business. Peter's only task is to follow Jesus. And John was already doing that. See, Jesus even here reminds Peter that during the crucifixion, John was there. Remember, Jesus turns to John and says, John, this is your mother, and to Mary, this is your son. John is there. He's present. And Jesus reminds Peter that that he needs to step that Peter needs to get in line he needs to step into this because John was already doing what Jesus had called him to do what matters most for the disciples of Jesus is to follow him and do his will come what may what matter, what matters to us is that we follow Jesus we do his will we do what he has called us to do no matter what of course, like many, just like us, we like to play the compare game too. Some of us say, oh, why couldn't that be me? Or, or that's not fair, I should be doing that. I should be recognized for that. I would be better at that. And you and I need to remember that God has called us to a specific task. He has called us to a specific ministry and he promises to equip us to do what he's called us to do. And we can be complete in him in that call. Remember, each of us are a part of the body of Christ. Each of us has our own call. Each of us has to be willing to fulfill the call that God has given to us. Jesus calls Peter again and says to him that he needs to love him. He needs to feed his sheep. He needs to tend for those that are going to be under his care to prove and to show his love for Jesus. Again, in our conclusion, we talk about how this is what Peter is called to do. This is what this conversation is about. Jesus is now calling Peter and saying to him that he needs to step out and do the specific ministry that he's called him to do. And Peter is reminded by Christ that he now has the power to step up and be what it is that God has called him to do. Jesus gives Peter a new commandment in this call and calls him to love one another and to show his love 
by loving those he's called to serve. Again, John 13, 34 and 35 says this. So now I am giving you a new covenant. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Our love for each other proves our love for Jesus Christ. May we be people of love. Church, right now we're going to go into our normal time of offering, and we've gone to a time of worship at the end of our services, if you haven't noticed. We've done a few more songs, more than just one. Uh, but it's a time for us to, uh, just to give it to God and just surrender to Him. Uh, I want to thank you so much uh, for being faithful in your tithes and your offerings. Uh, I get to do what I get to do because of you. Pastor Steve gets to do what he gets to do because of you. And Boo gets to do what she gets to do because of you. Good girl. So we just thank you so much for, for the tithe. And we can continue to reach out in the community and help people. So please uh, continue that. We thank you so much for that. And uh, right now I just want to get into a place of worship. Let's just worship the Lord. This next song that we're going to do is Yes, I Will. And it talks about praising God in the valleys. And a lot of us are there right now and uh, giving him thanks. Uh, but like the chorus says, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valleys. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. And that's what we're doing. And that's what I hope you're doing at home. Uh, I hope that you're singing out to the Lord today. So before we go into that, let's go into a, uh, let's a prayer and pray with the offering and just uh, prepare ourselves. Heavenly Father, we come to you today just so thankful for the gift of music and all the people that are here to share their gifts and talents to serve you, Lord. Um, Father, we thank you for the many blessings you give us. We can't thank you enough. Father, we just pray that you'll take this offering and these tithes, Lord, that you'll use it for your glory. Let us be good stewards of what is given, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be a worship leader here at Lake Magdalene United Methodist Church and be in ministry full time. Father, I lift up our congregation at home who uh, has been away from us for a long time and we're ready to get back together. So, Father, I just pray that you'll make a way so that we can come together soon and worship you in your house. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. 
change to
benediction today is found in Philippians, the second chapter, just the first few verses from the message. If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in the community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the top. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with yourself getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Jesus thought of himself. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe. I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe. I see